The prevailing management paradigm today is still that for mass production. Of course, there have been some improvements in terms of responsibility delegation, information transparency, participation of employees in certain discussions, etc. But traditional management's essential purpose remains to ensure that the moderately qualified employees can work with efficiency on repetitive tasks based on standards in big quantities. For this reason, organizations are traditionally structured in silo functions and hierarchical levels with rules and procedures to make sure that things are predictable and in line with standards. This works well only when the environment is stable and predictable, which is not the case anymore since we all know that today's business world is extremely volatile and unpredictable, so the old style of leadership and management doesn't fit anymore. Inevitably, we have to embrace the shift from traditional management paradigm towards servant leadership, which can ensure that the employees or the teams receive autonomy and the people with proper level of intelligence and expertise can face the company's clients directly so as to be able to rapidly deliver real value to them and adapt to changes when necessary. Let's check out the differences between the characteristics of traditional managers and the servant leaders. Traditional managers base their work mainly on plans and deliverable tasks, while servant leaders rely on inspiring visions in line with the organization's strategy. They have more short-term plans and objectives that allow the deliverables to emerge naturally from the teams. The traditional managers are often omnipresent. They want to know what everyone is doing all the time, while servant leaders understand that people need autonomy to be happy and perform well. So, they establish a frame of autonomy in which they review the results periodically. The traditional managers are omniscient in the sense that their professional path often evolves in the same domain precisely, and in order to become a manager, they often continuously develop in the same domain to master the content and all the details. While servant leaders realize that due to the volatility of the environment and the complexity of the solutions, they can no longer master all the contents and details. Instead, they need to understand well the trends and the tendencies and make sure that the content leaders can emerge naturally out of the teams. Traditional managers are omnipotent. They take all the decisions, which is normal since their omnipresence and omniscience in their domain puts them in a position to take even the smallest decisions for the teams. In contrast, servant leaders understand that they are not the most knowledgeable ones in all domains, and they must leave the decisions to be taken by those who are the most suitable ones based on the hierarchies of competences. Here is a quote from Lao Tzu, from which the first sentence is the most interesting for us. Concerning the best leaders, on top of the list are those whom most people haven't noticed yet. It makes perfect sense. The more autonomous a team is, the less necessary to manage the team in the old way, since the team can truly manage themselves autonomously. It's easy to understand, but why is it so difficult to do so in practice? Because in many organizations, people who are rewarded are those who speak loud or manage crisis, or who are seen to work overtime during weekends. In this kind of environment, it's difficult to have servant leadership to emerge and be rewarded properly. The number one practice for servant leadership is to establish a frame of autonomy. One of the dimensions is decisional autonomy, and the other is the autonomy measured in time. In the dimension of decisional autonomy, there are different sorts of decisions in an organization, including strategic decisions, tactical decisions, and operational decisions. What we want to do is bring the decisions to the lowest possible level closest to the related expertise, so that it is those with the right expertise that makes the right decisions. For example, people at the strategic level can decide what product to make by which team, while people at the team level can make tactical decisions like what are the most interesting product features to develop and operational decisions like whether the button should be red or green, etc. We can see that thanks to this frame of autonomy, we are able to provide the teams with real freedom or autonomy to do their best in work. In the dimension of autonomy duration, 
Evidently, if we have to review what has been done every single day, it is not going to be efficient. We need to have a proper period of autonomy. Typically, it refers to an iteration that can have many other different versions of names, which is essentially a period of autonomy that is repetitive. In the end of each iteration, we need to review what has been accomplished, what should be done. For the next iteration, and very importantly, what are the lessons that can be drawn from the mistakes we've made in the previous iteration? Note that mistakes must be allowed in the practice of servant leadership, so that the teams can learn and improve themselves in the future. To have an effective frame of autonomy, it is also really important to have concrete, measurable, and attainable objectives on which the teams can self-organize. And autonomously create the necessary roles and engagement rules, such as when to meet, how to collaborate, or where to place the documents, etc. The only time when a servant leader's intervention is needed during an iteration is in the case of escalation, when management support is required to unblock the team quickly in order to reach their objectives. Also, the teams need to be transparent with their work because transparency can generate trust. And to receive autonomy, there must be enough trust among team members, different teams, and between managements and the teams. For example, if a team keeps their work secrets, like in a black box, they will be constantly questioned by the managements and other teams, since there is no trust from the organization in their work. If a team works with transparency by showing critical information visually on a whiteboard in a shared space where everyone can see, such as how they work, what are the deliverables and risks, or what is the progress, etc., this team will be able to naturally receive a lot of trust from people in the organization and thus gain real autonomy. In the end, about the cascade of autonomy authorization. Although the system we see here may only show one level of the organization, the teams, in reality, there exists the cascade of autonomy authorization up to down in the organization. Imagine that the directors authorize appropriate level of autonomy to the divisional managers, the divisional managers do so to the team leaders, and the team leaders to the teams. Consequently, the teams will reach great efficiency thanks to the autonomy they receive, since. As long as they can attain the objectives by the end of each iteration, there is no need of management approvals or micromanagement. This will also lead to effectively synchronized iterations, because thanks to the authorization of autonomy, information can be rapidly circulated vertically and horizontally in the organization through informal meetings here and there, which is much more efficient than if we use formal committees. Or other traditional forms of communication that are not synchronized. Servant leaders understand that we need to reward the individuals as well as the teams. We often have evaluations of performance that combine both evaluations of teams based on value delivery and evaluations of individuals based on their contribution to the team evaluated by other team members. Evaluations of teams can allow and encourage collaboration in the teams. Since the results depend on the combined efforts made by all team members, and the evaluations of individuals can allow teamwork to be distributed evenly among team members, and can especially avoid the situation where those who don't perform well could get away easily only thanks to the positive results of their team evaluation. A servant leader develops his colleagues beyond his team. There are two ways of doing so. One by the market of ideas, the other by the market of roles. For example, when an employee has a good idea, even if it's not within the responsibility of the servant leader, the leader will help this employee to promote his idea. And if the idea is realized with success, the employee will be rewarded. Then, in the market of roles, we need the right people to work in the right place. This can be done by authorizing the squads to engage those they need. And allowing the employees to negotiate a role in their desired squad, both with the help of servant leaders to realize the employees' full potential in the right place. But what can servant leaders gain out of all this? Since it seems that they are so very generous that they are almost invisible in the organization and keep doing good deeds without any noticeable reward. 
Well, if we have a closer look at the organizations where this kind of leadership is well developed, we can see that servant leaders are actually greatly valued and with increasing influence in the organization. Because when good ideas and good employees are promoted, people know for sure where the ideas come from and how the talents are found. So every time when a servant leader promotes a good idea or a good employee, especially out of his team, in return, he naturally gains more visibility and influence in the whole organization. In addition, if the servant leader's team perform well with less and less need of his help, the leader can then have more time and energy in finding other more interesting or more important opportunities. Therefore, all those are perfectly in line with developing a good career path for the servant leader. Let's check once again the purpose of embracing servant leadership from the whole organization's perspective. Well, what we want is an organization with a whole series of agile squads that can react rapidly to all changes and thus deliver real value to the client, for which servant leadership is one of the essential instruments, meaning that in order to have agile and autonomous squads, an organization must embrace servant leadership. A concrete way to realize the shift from managers in the functional structure to servant leaders in the value-oriented structure is to review the two different types of hierarchy side by side. Here on the left, we have a traditional structure with different levels of management, and on the right, a value-oriented structure with decentralized squads in tribes. The arrows connecting the two parts display the various possibilities for people based on their functional competence and the legitimacy to shift their roles from left to right. For example, a product manager in the old structure may become a customer representative or a tribe leader in the new structure. Similarly, an expert or a team leader in the traditional structure may take the role of facilitator for community of practice in the decentralized structure. Besides competence and the legitimacy, we also need to look at the aspect of people's aptitude. The aptitudes of servant leaders are very different from those of traditional managers, which we will learn shortly in the next slide. Also, what isn't shown on the image are the elements structured traditionally besides the value-oriented structure. Here, what we can see on the right-hand part is only a whole series of squads, and what we cannot see are the typical functions of human resource or finance, etc. This concerns actually the subject of by model, in which the organization will continue to be in need of different types of traditional management functions, depending on the issues faced by the organization. What are the aptitudes of servant leaders? In the list are the typical behaviors that are observed repetitively from good servant leaders in value-oriented organizations. We can also say that people who show these behaviors consistently in an organization are good candidates for the roles of servant leaders. Another important factor to measure a potential candidate for servant leader's role is the desire of the person. As shown in the diagram, both the aptitudes and the desire of the person should be taken into account. What we need to do is ask the person what he can do and what he wants to do. We can also invite people who are established servant leaders in other value-oriented organizations that have already finished the shift, asking them what they do in practice in their daily work as a servant leader and how this works for them, so that the candidates will be able to provide better and more reasonable answers to the questions concerning his aptitudes and the desire, as the answers would be closer to reality with the proper reference to other servant leaders' real experience. The strategies to initiate the shift towards servant leaders. We can go through this using the innovation adoption curve, except what we have here is innovation of behaviors. Firstly, we can have innovators who already have servant leaders' aptitudes to form one or two pilot teams. Then we put in place the strategy of coach the coach, with which through proper coaching techniques, Existing servant leaders help expand the leadership to other teams that are already equipped with basic aptitudes, until a whole tribe and then eventually the whole organization adopt servant leadership. Often the techniques or practices we use in this process include conventional trainings in coaching, delegation, 
or listening, etc. But what's more creative or effective can be management hacks. What are management hacks? Behaviors that are practical and allow us to experiment and have results quickly. And above all, they have the potential of starting a whole chain of reactions in the entire organization. Take the practice of rapid decision, for example. We can put it in place in one or two weeks for a management committee or a big pilot project committee. From there, in two to three months, we will be able to see the expected results, like better decisions that are taken more rapidly. As a consequence, more interest will be generated in the practice around the organization, which will increase management support received by the teams adopting this practice, and thus leading to even more teams practicing rapid decision. And in the end, senior level management will also realize how much they can benefit from the practice. For example, their decisions can be diffused more rapidly among the employees, and the feedbacks can be received more quickly as well. So, what we are talking about here are really practical techniques that can be quickly put in place and take effect rapidly and at moderate scale, not something that is huge and intimidating like a transformation program. In the end, it's worth adding that servant leadership can also help people better understand the kind of techniques and behaviors that are encouraged by the organization.